talk about one of my biggest heroes and influences, Danny Gatton. Um, When I first heard this guy, totally changed my life almost overnight. And I just figured I'd tell a little bit of that story. So here I was, you know, long hair, cowboy hat, Stevie Ray Vaughnaby, and walking down the street. No, I was was at a gig and a guy handed me a cassette tape and he said, you should check this out, young man. And it had a guitar player named Roy Lanham on one side. Now, if you haven't checked out Roy Lanham, you should, and maybe I'll do a video on him later because he's an unsung hero. But anyways, on the other side was Danny Gatton, and it was like I put this thing in the tape player in the car on the way home and just, man, my head exploded, I think. I, I would just change my life overnight. I was hearing stuff I'd never heard before. It was a ferocity of virtuosity, uh, intent, a sense of humor, just a, t- a tone, a technique, all these things that just were coming out of nowhere and they were just flying at me. And then I, I was just completely blown away, uh, really, truly blown away. So what's the first thing you do? Well, OK, this is 1990 something. So I go to the record store and they have nothing. <laughs> so back then they had catalogs that you go through and order stuff and they'd get them in for you. So I was at Specs or Peaches Records and I ordered... Uh, 88 Elmira Street and Cruise and Deuces, which were his two major label albums on Elektra, which you should get if you don't have them. Um, and then I think I ordered some other stuff because he had passed away recently and they were starting to come out with some other stuff uh, on a smaller label called Big Mo. And I got Portraits. I got Relentless, the record he did with Joey DeFrancesca, the organ player. Um, I got Redneck Jazz Explosion. I got a couple live things. I got anything I could get my hands on, basically. And, man, I just was, you know, absorbed and, and just enthralled from the first minute. I had to bring it all in. I had to take it all in and start to figure out some of these things. And there's so much technique and harmonic knowledge and all these things that I learned from him. But the biggest thing I learned from Danny Gatton was to be fearless and honest. He played whatever he felt like and whatever he heard when he heard it. It was like he heard it, he felt it, it came out. No filter, no disconnect. And it's such an honest way to play. And sometimes it would be incredibly humorous. Sometimes it would just be incredibly virtuosic and you would just be like, what the heck? And then sometimes it would be almost silly or funny or weird. But you could tell that he was truly in the moment. And someone who just had so much facility in this link between his head and his hands and his heart. And Man, it was truly inspiring to, you know, and then I got to meet people who knew him. Uh, I didn't ever get to see him or hang out with him. And I tell Joe Bonamassa I'm super jealous of that all the time. But I met people who had played with him and been around him, and they'd tell me stories, and they'd give me a bootleg or two. And, man, he became, like, for a while, like, my biggest influence. Um, and he's certainly in my top five. I mean, he's in my my group, my Pantheon, my Mount Rushmore, whatever. Um, so let's get into some of the things that really – turned me out about Danny Gatton and and that I had to learn and and change the way I played. Well, what were the first things that I tried to learn? Because try is is the optimum word here. Um, Well, on that tape, I talked about this a little bit in the hybrid lesson, the hybrid picking lesson. Uh, There was a version of Danny playing Ray Charles' What I Say. And we know that. But they were playing it really fast. And Danny was playing it hybrid pick. And he was doing this. And he 
had the slap back on like I do, and he had those open strings, and that was my introduction into hybrid picking. I tried to figure that out and did the best I could, and man, it just really blew me away, and I, I would listen closely, and I'd start to pick out things, number one, that I could recognize, so maybe they'd be blues licks that I was familiar with, so he'd play a lot of double stops, lots and lots of double stops, uh, stuff like Back at the Chicken Shack, those blues uh, in double stops that we all know. That stuff, right? But he would play. And then he'd double up. Or... Like, whoa. And it was like the same language, but played in a whole new way. And using those fingers, man, and getting that bounce, there's a real bounce to it. And when I got that under my hands, it was like it opened a whole new world for me. Uh, now, he would sometimes keep that note going, as I talked about in a hybrid thing, and I couldn't do it. And because I couldn't keep the going while I did... It turned into... And that that became a big part of my playing. You've probably heard me play all that. Right? You probably heard me play stuff like that. And it came from me trying to approximate what Danny was doing, and I couldn't do it. And it, it ended up really becoming a thing, you know, that sounds like me, I think, when I listen to it. But it's all directly influenced by Danny and me trying to cop what he was doing. Then I started to hear him incorporating other things that I recognized, like a little bit of jazz harmony and swing language and straight blues language. But he was mixing it up with that hybrid picking, with the open strings, with the, the double stops, with the slapback delay. And it became clear, hey, man, it's OK to like mix all these things up and kind of find something new and unique that's yours. And I was hearing him play all this stuff like sometimes in one in a blues, he would play all these different things in one chorus. It was just amazing stuff. He would play some stuff that kind of started to sound like this. like whoa you can do that you can play jazz and blues and country and swing and mix things up and open strings and use your fingers and man it was majorly eye-opening and then I dove in further and I started working on a few other things then I started to notice cool things about his rhythm playing and tonal choices he was one of the first guys after like Stevie and, and Hendrix that I saw have a Leslie on stage so I registered that and then I heard it and in fact, he had a guitar with a big controller on it called the Magic Dingus Box that controlled his Leslie, controlled an Echoplex, controlled the reverb and tremolo in his Fender amps. His dad built it. It was pre midi with a big cable hanging off of it. Unbelievable stuff. But he would play the Leslie with his tone knob rolled down and do stuff like this that you've probably heard me do. So that stuff already kind of jived with what I was learning as a rhythm player with those stabs and that pulse. And then it started to give me that feeling of, of playing like an organ player. And, and uh, man, I started to bring all that into my playing. 
it was amazing the stuff he would do with the Leslie on, with the slapback, the rhythm he would play. Even without the Leslie, just stuff. He was just great at playing that. had just this time where it didn't matter what he went for it just added up and landed and I really aspired to that and I've tried to bring that into my playing and a lot of that came from hearing him play rhythm and then bust out into fills like that really amazing stuff all right we can't talk about Danny without at least acknowledging the speed man it was breakneck (laughs) and you know speed is not the be all end all and not the most important thing but I'd be lying if I said I listened to him play and I didn't want to try to figure out some of that stuff. And there was a song on Cruise and Deuces called So Good. I can't remember what key it's in, but it was a blues. It was something like... Something like that. And, uh, man, he was just playing the most unbelievable stuff. so fast like and I I couldn't do it as fast as he could but just trying to keep up kind of (laughs) informed the way that I play fast for the rest of my life it's all based off stuff that he was doing and man he was just unbelievable the amount of technique, and a lot of that comes from being a banjo player. He was a tremendous banjo player, and he just had this thing with his fingers that was magical. And I, I can't capture all that. I'll never be able to do it. But, man, the speed was an unbelievable element to his playing. Yeah, he also was not afraid to acknowledge his influences. He loved Roy Buchanan. He loved, you know, jazz guitar players, Wes Montgomery. He loved banjo players. You know, he he was just a, an open book of music. He just loved music, you could tell. And, man, it was just so inspiring. You know, I'll still sit down and the little licks that he played, the 2-5-1, you know, and playing that. All those. That stuff is, you know, I'll never forget that. Man, so fast, but but amazing. and or, or listen to the way he plays things like Harlem Nocturne. That is equally as influential to me as Roy. You know, that's a, a big part of like me writing a tune like Penance was hearing him filter Roy through more changes, kind of like he did on Harlem Nocturne. So, man, if you don't know Danny Gatton, you need to do yourself a favor and uh, buy some of the records and just take a closer look. They didn't call him the humbler for a reason, you know. He, he was something very special that we lost too soon. And uh, he changed my life just, just by being a musician, just by existing. Because, I mean, he never knew me. Um, but, man, so special. And uh, I'll ever be, uh, forever be indebted to him. So thank you, Danny Gatton, Telemaster, and uh, ruling. All right, and uh, members, I'll probably do a little addendum to this. If you're not a member, you can join or at least please subscribe and support the channel. I appreciate the support. And Danny Gatton, forever ruling.